Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, don't panic. I, I made the title for the audience, but I didn't realize that it was going to apply to me when I saw how big this room was. Um, so yes, the very long title of this talk is Don't Panic, Reinforcement Learning is Full of Magical Things, Patiently Waiting for Our Wits to Grow Sharper. And if you got the reference, this is a Douglas Adams reference from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If you have read the book, you might enjoy this talk more than others, but I hope that it's not a requirement. Uh, but I actually want to start looking back. And I want to remember that a year ago, we had our first edition of Upper Bound. At the time, it was called AI Week. And we had a set of amazing talks. The opening keynote for this session was Martha White's. And her title was Reinforcement Learning, the next big thing in AI. I myself gave a talk a couple of days later. And it was how Atari started the golden age of reinforcement learning. And we're all very excited about this, about reinforcement learning. And what is interesting is that when you fast forward it a couple of months, actually, something happened. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, but it definitely didn't feel that reinforcement learning was the next big thing in AI. Uh, we got that prediction really wrong. Uh, as a reinforcement learning researcher, I don't feel that we're at the golden age of reinforcement learning anymore, even though some might claim that reinforcement learning is uh, being used in the systems. It doesn't feel that it's the golden age anymore. And for those who know me, I second guess myself a lot. And this was a moment of introspection to me. It was a moment to challenge my beliefs and say, wait, am I working on this because I believe it's the right thing? Am I working on this because it was popular in the past? And, and this is what I want this talk to be about. This talk is supposed to be about this reflection that I had that I want to share with you because I think that what's happening is that by talking with grad students, by talking with junior researchers, there is a lot of freaking out going on between the reinforcement learning students, the students doing reinforcement learning, but also students doing uh, working on other areas. And Spoiler alert, the title of this talk is Don't Panic, but I want to walk you through some of those, those reasonings. And as I said at the beginning, I started, the whole point of this talk was to start with Don't Panic. This was the first concept that I had in my mind. And I was like, okay, so I definitely need to make this a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy theme talk. Uh, what could go wrong? And then I went searching for quotes that would actually allow me to, to give this talk. And then I found this one. It says that the universe is a large and confusing place. Fortunately, at any particular time, there is usually a planet that has the best seat in the house. And we can replace that, right? We can replace the universe by AI, and maybe we can read it to say that AI is a large and confusing field. Fortunately, at any particular time, there is usually a subfield that has the best seat in the house. And the question, that one of the questions that I've been asking and one of the things that I want to talk about today is, where is reinforcement learning seat in this house? So until recently, it felt that we had the front row. But again, when you look at all the headlines, at least from one angle, maybe it doesn't look like that anymore. And this is what I want to talk about. But, but I have a confession to make. Uh, I start with the don't panic and and then I started with the don't panic thing, and I said, okay, so now I, I need quotes. And I wanted a quote that was talking about where we place in the universe or something like that. And then I asked for help. Chad GPT gave me this quote. I didn't remember it, it's, I, ha it's, I have to confess. And then what happened was just like I was being asked, can you send us the abstract? Can you send us the title of this talk? So I wrote the abstract, and I actually, if you read the abstract, most people probably didn't, but if you read the abstract of my talk, I actually used this sentence in the, in the abstract. But then what happened was that I was just like, okay, cool, but now it's time to make these slides. I might as well make sure that this quote exists. And apparently it doesn't. So I went back to ChatGPT and I said, 
hey, is this quote from Douglas Adams? And Hitchhiker's Guide, no, it's not. I was like, but you literally just told me it is. I'm like, I'm sorry, yes, you're right, it is a quote. And at this point, I'm very confused whether it's a quote or not. <laughs> I, but so for the sake of being safe and being precise, let's say it's not. I, I didn't have the time to read the whole book again. Um, but I think that it's, it's all, this, is, this is interesting because at the same time, I think it's interesting to acknowledge how impressive it is that a system like that managed to come up with a quote that sounds like Douglas Adams, that could actually fool me about it. And it was so fitting. So hats off. And, and, I, and the reason I wanted to start with this story is to say that this talk is not about this. This is not a talk about large language models. This is not a talk about what they can do or what they cannot do. There are enough talks of this already. And I'm definitely not the most equipped person to talk about this. My talk today is again, where is reinforcement learning sit in this universe? Okay? So I'm not really that serious, so I needed to come up with a joke title to start the whole keynote and make the life of the communications team at Amy really difficult because I got so many messages of how long my title was. Uh, and what I should actually maybe have sent them is this title. Reinforcement learning, the current landscape of AI. It just felt a little bit too boring for me. Uh, and maybe to even put it in a, even a, a, a follow up on that, I will say that this is a, my very personal take on some of the things that I think that where we are in the field, but also some of the learnings that I had. And I just wanted to share my own perspective over this. I think that for some people in the audience, this is going to be extremely boring and some pieces are going to be obvious. Uh, but for some, they are going to strongly disagree with what I'm going to say. Uh, when I was invited to give this talk, Nathan invited me to maybe challenge a little bit the audience, so I might have gone a little bit overboard. Um, but the main message of this talk, thinking about researchers that are not working in large language models, I'm going to focus on reinforcement learning because that's the thing that I know about, but for researchers who are not working on this, the main message is don't panic. It's okay, okay? And to make it more confusing, just like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, my talk today is going to be a trilogy in four parts. Uh, and what I'll be talking about today is what I think uh, in this, as I was thinking about where we are in the field and what's the role of reinforcement learning, I think that what are some of maybe the failings and opportunities that we have in the field. I want to talk about some of the lessons that I learned or how I updated my beliefs about the type of questions that I should be asking or the type of assumptions I should be making based on this recent success. Because I will say that one thing is to say that I'm not going to completely change my research area because there is a new cooler kid in the neighborhood, but it also doesn't mean that there is nothing to be learned about, about that. And this is what I want to share with you today. So my talk, it's a trilogy in four parts, so as a spoiler, the four parts are leverage external data, choosing problems wisely, learning continually, and considering your hardware. But before we get there, I want to tell you a story. And this story it goes back to 2019. I just finished my PhD. I joined Google. I'm looking for my next thing to do. And, and then when I joined Google, they had this project that was a starting. They were like, Loon had approached Google Brain and said, can you, we would like to fly balloons in the stratosphere. And we would like to have, we're, we're already actually flying balloons in the stratosphere, but we think that reinforcement learning could do a much better job at doing this. Than, than, what you, than, than what we are doing right now. They had this control engineering solution. Do you think you can help us that? And, and that's what we set up to do. And the motivation that the Loon had is that if you think about, they wanted to provide internet to people, but they wanted to, internet, to provide internet to people who are in hard to reach areas. And the intuition is the following. The way we get internet in big cities is that you have an antenna, and this antenna, let's say it's downtown, it's going to serve a region of maybe six kilometers, of like a, a radius of six kilometers. And if you think about how many people think fit in that area, it's a lot of people. So economically speaking, it makes a lot of sense. But then, if you're in a hard to reach region, things become trickier because 
it, the, even if you could get there, because think about like maybe you want to go to the middle of the jungle in the Amazon forest to provide some to internet to some tribes, it's really hard to get to the jungle. And even if you could there, the economic cost would be pretty high. So what they thought about was what if we could have a balloon stationing in that region so it would work as a much, much taller antenna, a 20 kilometer tall antenna, then it would be able to serve a much bigger region. And then if it's able to serve this much bigger region, then it would, would make sense to do that. And the problem we were focusing on was the problem of what we call station keeping, which was how do we make sure that we are, that we, the balloon can stay where it's supposed to be. So this balloon, it's a, what we call a fixed envelope balloon, so it has a fixed volume. And, and it, it's not propelled, it's, it's solar powered and it's not propelled. All it can do is to go up, to go down, or to stay. So you put the balloon somewhere, and there is a wind blowing in one direction, the balloon say, I really don't want to go there. So the balloon has two things to do. It can either go up or go down. And if it finds a wind that is blowing on the different direction, then maybe it's going to be blowing the direction that it wants to go, and that's how this problem works. Okay, and of course, the balloon doesn't know what the winds look like, except where the balloon is, because that's, that's how this, where the sensors are. And long story short, we did it, we succeeded, we, we actually have this, had this result where we were, we actually deployed uh, 13 balloons in the, like we flew the balloons on simulation, we flew them on tests, but eventually we deployed 13 balloons in the Pacific Ocean and we ran them for more than a month to get statistical confidence that these balloons were doing the right thing. And like it's easy to overlook this, but these balloons are the size of a tennis court. Uh, and we did this and, and eventually we were able to show that the DeepRL solution that we came up with was actually much better. It was more accurate in terms of the percentage of time that the balloon was able to stay within the region it was supposed to serve. Uh, and it was also more power efficient because this was also a constraint that we had. We wanted it to, it was a multi-objective optimization problem that is stay where you are but you are also supposed to be mindful of, the, of power. Uh, this paper, we published this paper at Nature uh, and it was all good. But the point is that in, one, in that paper, in this Nature paper, there is a plot that I think doesn't necessarily get much love. And it's easy to overlook a plot in a, in a long paper. But this is, this is the plot that I want to emphasize because what we observed when we, were, when we were looking at the behavior of the balloon is that consistently, we could consistently see this behavior that during the daytime, the balloon, the reinforcement learning solution would want to go at a lower altitude. And and this was a very different behavior than the one that we were seeing from the control engineering solution, which is a was set point controller. And, and then we went to the low engineers, like the actual balloon engineers, and we said, look, we're seeing this behavior. Can you explain this to us? And they look at us and said, oh, this is brilliant. We never thought about it. I was like, still, can you explain this to us? Uh, and then they're like, yeah, yeah, sure. So the way this works is the following. As I said, this balloon is a fixed volume envelope. So if the balloon is up in the air, and you want the balloon to go down, if it's a fixed volume, all you can do is to increase its density. So the way you do is that you increase its density by pumping air into this fixed volume, and then the balloon now is heavier, uh, given the same volume, it's going to go down. Uh, if you want the balloon to go up, you open a valve, the air is going to come out, so the balloon becomes lighter, and then it goes up again. So that's how it works. In case you're curious, that's also how submarines work. I didn't know until I had worked with the balloons, but that's how submarines go up and down in the ocean. Um, and as I said, these balloons are solar powered. So what happens is that by the end of the day, when the sun sets, the balloon has full battery. The, it's fully powered, the sun is there, it's good. But now the balloon needs to be the whole night just with the battery that it's using. So. And this is tricky because if the balloon uses too much energy and runs out of power, it, a, a bad wind can come and blow the balloon hundreds of kilometers away from where it's supposed to, to be. So the next morning when it wakes up, uh, the balloon is like, oh, yeah, I'm kind of far. So you have to balance this, how much am I energy efficient and how much I make sure that I stay within the region. And what this, but, but if you think about this, Pumping air into the balloon, it costs energy. 
opening a valve doesn't cost any energy. So what the balloon learned to do was that when the sun is going to, to go down and I'm not going to have sunlight, I might as well go to the bottom of the altitude, all other things being equal. Because then, if I see a bad wind, I can just open a valve and I can go up and scan the atmosphere of looking for a good wind for free. I'm not using energy. So put it in a different way, the balloon learned to store potential energy. And this was without ever being programmed. This was just by interacting with the world, feeling, in a sense, with sensors, the physics of the world, what feels good, what feels bad, and learning that this was the wise thing to do. It discovered, this is the key, it discovered this new behavior that after we saw it, we could actually explain it, but no one had thought about it before. And I think that this is one of the wonders of reinforcement learning, is this ability to discover new behavior. Because the premise of reinforcement learning is that we have an agent interacting with the environment to maximize reward, and the learning comes from this interaction. So you do things that feel good or that don't feel good, and you learn this behavior. So you are not constrained by what you saw, because if you have a question and you say, oh, I wonder what would have happened if I did this, well, you might as well do it the next time. And you're constantly learning and gathered, gathering this knowledge. And I think that this is fascinating about reinforcement learning. This is not the only time this happened. It happens a lot of times. So, uh, for example, when uh, DeepMind reported AlphaGo, for example, there is this, the documentary on, on the internet about this, and there is the famous Move 37, which left Lee Sidol flabbergasted and people saying that this is true creativity. Again, it was a behavior that humans could not even think about that was just the right thing to do at that time. Um, less than a year ago, uh, it, there was another paper published at Nature reporting how, it was, how they use reinforcement learning to control the plasma inside the tokamak, a nuclear fusion reactor. And one of the things that they did was to be able to get a plasma configuration, changing the coils in, the, in this, like controlling the coils in this nuclear fusion reactor, that it was not clear to humans that it was possible to get that plasma configuration. So again, by just interacting with the world, we learned and we discovered behaviors that we hadn't thought about and maybe we did not even know they were possible. Um, so again, don't panic. I think that there are a lot of magical things that we can do in reinforcement learning. It's easy to be overwhelmed by a lot of the, the recent headlines and a lot of the very impressive successes that we're seeing, but the success of a field doesn't imply that another field is not successful uh, or that it's not valuable. It's, I think it's the opposite. Actually, we're just making better AIs in general, you know? Um, and then, there, but there, there is a problem. Like maybe as a grad student in the room, uh, you're looking at this like, yeah, cute. You're telling me about stratospheric balloons, nuclear fusion reactors, but what if I don't have a supercomputer? What if I don't have balloons to fly? Like, can I still do research and reinforcement learning? And, and I want to go into a foray of, uh, to show some of the research that we have done, to show that what I think is really cool research that can be done, done in very low scale, but uh, that it's also uh, still very related to a lot of those success. Because when you look at a lot of those success, and, I, and it hit me like this when I, when I was actually designing the, this, the balloon, the algorithm to fly the balloons, is that the way we generally talk about reinforcement learning, and this is a diagram that maybe I should have started with, uh, is that we're going to have this agent interact with the world, with the environment. And at each time step, the agent is going to receive an observe, it's going to see an observation, it's going to see a reward signal that it wants to maximize, and it's going to take an action. This action is going to then lead to a different observation, a different reward, and the cycle goes on forever and ever. Uh, and what actually, if you open this box, that is this agent box, uh, we oftentimes have, we are either computing a value function or a policy, and this is computed using what I would like to, I like to call agent state. So the agent state is, um, is basically how the agent is representing the world. So if you have a fully observable problem, all you need is right in front of your eyes, then it's just the observation. But quite often it is not. When you're talking about flying balloons, when you're talking about playing poker, when you're this is not what happens. And 
And then what, what we do is that we build this internal state. This is potentially a recurrent state, and what generally the obvious solution that people do is you will slap LSTM there. It's fine. It's, that's what we, we're going to say is success. But then when you look at a lot of the results that I was showing you before, uh, like I was, I was telling you about how we flew balloons in the stratosphere, another cover that I had uh, of science was how um, Mike Bowling, who is one of the AMI fellows here as well, and his team managed to come up with the first computer poker player that was able to uh, beat professional players in Texas holding uh, no limit. Uh, in that one, they, they also did something similar than what we did. And the, another example that we did was, the, another example that I had was the science robotics cover that was how some team in South Korea, I think it's from South Korea, they, they developed a robot that was able to play curling and actually beat Olympians at the game of curling. And when you look at a lot of that, they all had an extra ingredient in this, in this solution. Uh, it's what we called uh, auxiliary inputs, and when I say we, I mean uh, David Tao. Tao was a master student here in the department, and he was supervised by myself and Adam White, who is another of the Amy Fellows. Uh, and what we noticed is that the agent had what we termed as auxiliary input, which is you receive the observation, but you just don't throw it inside, a, on a, let's say, an LSTM or a recurrent neural net network. You do some computation before. Uh, what is this computation? In the case of the balloons, what we did was that we actually had a lot of forecasts of what we thought the winds were going to be in different altitudes. But not only the forecasts, we also had a measure, we were using a Gaussian process, about the uncertainty that we had over those forecasts. So we were literally feeding to the agent uncertainties as part of its observation, if you will. Um, for poker, for example, uh, counterfactuals were being computed outside the, this, this neural network, so they are fed as input as well. Um, for curling, as I said, they, they had this, uh, this uncertainties over their shots because the conditions of the ice would change throughout the game, so they couldn't assume that things were going to be always the same. But you always had this auxiliary input. So we set up to ask the question, in a sense, and this is an example of, of a master thesis that I wanted to share with the audience, is, is this useful? Is this something that we're just doing because, I don't know, it's convenient, but like, what does it, is this buying us? So we did it in a very tiny example. And the way we did this was the following. Let's imagine that we're going to go lobster fishing. So the, what this entails is that you're going to have, let's imagine that it's a very simple problem, you just have two cages that you put down the ocean. And I have a boat. And then the boat needs to choose if it wants to go to one specific location of the cage and, and, and pull it up to see if there is a lobster in there. If it doesn't, it, it, like, if it, there is, it's get, it gets happy, I got a lobster, but it, maybe it, it's not there yet, so it can decide to wait, whether wait or go to the different cage, and that's the problem. We, of course, this is just like, a, this is not even an MDP, for those who are familiar with the, what this is, it's just a depiction of what is the overall idea of the problem. We modeled it as a, as a factor, it's a fairly simple problem, basically, what everything is being written here is like, is, am I in state, am I in location one, am I in location two, am I in location three, uh, zero? Uh, if I am in location one, I get to see the reward in location one, I get to see if there is a lobster or not, is there a lobster in there, is there not a lobster in there, and this is, this is the, the gist of it. But the gist is that if you look at this, the agent doesn't have full observability, the agent doesn't know what the current state of the world is. Uh, but then still, this is arguably what we could use. This is what the agent's observation. So what would happen if we actually computed value, uh, value functions with this? And what we're seeing the crosses here are what are the four actual outcomes that you could expect if you had access to the full observation. So uh, I don't have a pointer with me, but if you look at the, the highest cross, uh, this is what if you had a reward or a lobster in location one and the location two, so you have a really high value. Then you have the two uh, crosses that are a little bit lower, that are if you had the, the lobster in one of the locations but not in the other, and vice versa. And then if you don't have the lobster uh, in both one and two, you cannot have a lobster in zero, you, the, you have the lowest value, this lowest cross in this 3D plot. So basically, I'm just showing like there are these four outcomes and you can expect that, well, if I have more lobsters in the world, I get to see 
more, uh, I, I have a higher value. And this is computing the ground truth. You cannot compute that with that vector that I showed you. If you actually compute the vector, or use the vector that I showed you, the value that you get is that dot at the bottom. Uh, that's, everything is collapsed because it's partially observable. So all those things look the same for the agent when the agent is in location zero because the agent doesn't know if there is a lobster in there or not. But then we said, what if we did this auxiliary input? And for this case of this auxiliary input, what we're going to do is that we're just going to add an exponential decay of the past observations that we had. And this is what happens. Suddenly now, we are able to compute for all these different observations that we get, because the different observations come from just this decay of these features, uh, all these values. And what this shows is that we're able to actually de-alias a lot of the states that, are, that were put together. And, and then we can actually have a much smoother surface to, to work on. This is not, and, and this is only for prediction, but we can also do this for control. And then if we do this for different actions, let's say the left action and the right action, something key happens here. Because if you look at the bottom of this plot, again, you had that diamond that is overlapping the yellow one, now it's the blue one, meaning that from the agent's perspective, if the agent is in location zero and the agent doesn't know anything about the world, the agent might as well say, well, I will randomly choose a location to go because, or I will consistently go to location one and wait until the lobster shows up because there is, the agent doesn't have the ability to represent anything else. Uh, but then obviously what happens is that if you have this more complex input, you'll be able, you start to be able to disentangle things and suddenly now you have some yellow crosses on top of blue crosses and vice versa, so you can distinguish between different policies. Um, and, and just to be clear, this is not a groundbreaking idea. In a sense, we're just trying to explain something that has been, is being used in the field for a very long time. It dates back to predicted state, predictive state representations which, uh, and GVFs, which is something that Rich Sutton, and, who is an Amy Fellow here and others, did uh, and proposed uh, I guess more than 10 years ago, even the GVF's paper now. Um, but it's interesting to understand like how those things interact and why are they, they are effective as, as from a practitioner's perspective. And of course, this is just a tiny example to provide some intuition of what's going on, but um, we can do this with DeepRL, and it's not that this is an attempt of replacing something like LSTMs, it's the opposite, we actually can show that if we do this alongside an LSTM, it actually empowers the LSTM to learn policies that are much better, even in much more complex problems. But let me go back to the balloons. Um, because now, now that maybe I convinced you that there are interesting projects that you as a student, as a junior researcher can, can, can look at, that it's tied to a lot of the things that we see out there, um, I want to do something different because when you write a paper and you give talks, you generally talk about the things that you did do. You generally talk about the things that you wrote in the paper. But what I want to tell you about the things that we didn't write in the paper when we were flying the balloons in the stratosphere. And what happened is that when, they, when the Loon team approached us, they said, look, we have a very accurate simulator. It's uncanny how accurate it is. Uh, bearing some, some constraints on how you can model winds and so on. Uh, and we also have reams of data of how we have flown the balloons in the past. Each balloon is a little bit different because the batteries start to, to become old, so the batteries don't have the same yield and, and all those things. So we have a lot of this data as well. Like They had flown balloons in the whole world. They had balloons that had literally like went gone around the world. Uh, they had balloons who flew for a whole year up in the stratosphere. Uh, we had data from flying balloons in Peru, fly, data from flying the, uh, balloons in Kenya. When we deployed this DeepRL solution, we actually served internet in Kenya for real people for a while with reinforcement learning. So we had all this data. And when we were flying the balloons, even with the reinforcement learning solution, we still had, we still had, we were still generating more data. So we had rims of data and a simulator. So what do we do? as good reinforcement learning researchers, and I'm sorry, this is just a caricature, we get the rims of data and we put it in the trash can. We have no idea how to use that. We're going to learn from scratch using the simulator. And, and that feels wrong. That feels wrong that there's so much experience uh, there 
so much data about how the nuance of the different balloons and how the battery runs out and how some balloons start to lose a little bit of volume. And somehow, we didn't, know, we didn't have the algorithm. It's not that we are just adamant that we don't want to use data, but it's just like we didn't have the toolkit to even know how to use that data. So let me go back to Douglas Adams. Because apparently human beings who are almost unique in having the ability to learn from experience of others are also remarkable for their apparent disinclination to do so. And I want to say that maybe reinforcement learning researchers, or at least a subset of them, are also remarkable for their apparent disinclination to use data. And again, reflecting upon some of the things that maybe we could learn from the success of large language models and some of the things that we have seen, uh, I think that the first thing that it became more obvious to me, maybe it's obvious for other people in the audience, and of course there is research about offline reinforcement learning, batch reinforcement learning, so it's not that I'm saying something that it's fundamentally groundbreaking, but personally it became more obvious to me about the importance of figuring out how to le leverage externally generated data when that is available. And it's important to say when it's available, because sometimes it's not available, and I still want our algorithms to be able to learn from scratch. But I think that the data itself, we should be able to, to leverage it in a much better way than we are right now. Uh, so that's the, that's the first piece. The second thing that I want to tell you about is, and this is probably the most controversial one, is that I think that we should think carefully about the problems we tackle, and importantly, how we talk about them. And, and what I mean by this is the following. If we talk about reinforcement learning, at least from the perspective of control, reinforcement learning is about maximizing rewards. And I love this because it's a very well-defined objective function. It's hard to be more well-defined than that. Here's a reward function, here's an objective, and I want your agent to learn how to, inter to interact with the world and learn how to maximize that signal. But then, we got very excited for a lot of the success that we had the last couple of years, the last 10 years or so. And we start, I mean, not we started, but it became much more prominent in the, in the public discourse that we start talking about intelligence. And we start talking about solving intelligence, general intelligence. And I personally think it's distracting. I don't know if it's a, a productive conversation to have, and I made it bold and underlined with the I think, because this is a very personal uh, opinion here. Because, and the reason, but I th the reason I think it's distracting, not productive, it's because it's undefined. If I ask, if you ask me what I mean by solving intelligence, it's going to be different than if you ask someone else in the audience, and probably you can get a hundred different answers in this audience what solving intelligence means. And somehow, when we're talking about solving intelligence, this is never clearly stated. Uh, and, and then each person is coming with their own assumptions of what, what that means. And, and then when I think about it, like, and I think about, well, should I be doing reinforcement learning? What are the lessons? Like, I think that one of the problems is that at the moment that we start talking about intelligence, it feels that we can do anything with reinforcement learning. Any problem out there, it's a reinforcement learning problem, we can tackle it. Well, but come on, that's not really true, right? Uh, and so, and then when I think about it, I think that reinforcement learning is particularly well suited for tackling problems that are not easy to describe with language. I really struggle to explain how difficult flying balloons in the stratosphere is because it's a hundreds of dimensions of wind speed and wind velocity, uh, wind bearing and, and uncertainty and the power constraints and the time of the day and where you want to get to. Think about all the hundreds, thousands, I don't know, of coils that you have in a nuclear fusion reactor and how you explain how you control them to control the plasma. It's really hard. Um, think about competitive racing, like Peter Stone is going to, to talk about this at the end of the day. Uh, how hard it is to like, yeah, we know how to drive. So now ask someone, can you clearly describe in words what driving entails? And I think that reinforcement learning is really good on those, all those problems. It's uncanny. But for most people, it's impossible to dissociate intelligence from language. Uh, and I think that's the problem. So when we're talking about intelligence, and some, a different field comes in and they ingest all this data about language, which is a social construct. It's arbitrary. And then you ingest all this data about language and you say, look, this is, this is it. 
Sometimes it, by just being able to communicate with you, it feels extremely impressive. Uh, and then it's easy to downplay other techniques because it doesn't sound like intelligence because of language and the type of problems that maybe each technique is suited to, to deal with. Uh, I like this quote because I think it's very fitting, which is, he learned to communicate with birds and discovered their conversation was fantastically boring. It was all to do with wind speed, wingspans, power to weight ratios, and a fair bit about berries. And I think that if we were able to talk with our reinforcement learning agents, the agent that is flying balloons in the stratosphere, it was going to be fantastically boring because it was all to do with wind speed, wind bearing, power, the, the amount of power that you have. So this is not appealing to humans in the perspective of being able to chat and communicate with this agent. It doesn't mean it's not impressive, but it's, it's not what we, what we generally do. You know? uh, there is this Brazilian singer and poet that I really like that he has this sentence that says that Narcissus thinks everything is ugly when it's not a mirror. And, and I think that it's a little bit to do with us. It's just like, well, is it really intelligence if it doesn't resemble we and what we do and it doesn't resemble language? Um, so, again, I think that's important to keep this in mind and not to forget reinforcement learning in this last decade has done so many impressive things that I'm pretty sure that if you asked almost anyone in the audience, maybe not the most optimistic ones, if they could thought that this was going to happen, they would say that this was fiction. Like, we have recommendation systems everywhere. We have general game playing algorithms. We have industrial automation applications like cooling commercial buildings, inventory management, gas turbine optimization, optimizing combustion in a coal-fired power plant. We have algorithms. We literally designed algorithms that we couldn't think by ourselves on how to do things better. We can do control, we can do robotics, we can do much more. We can like literally had COVID-19 border testing using reinforcement learning. It was a paper published at Nature, if I'm not mistaken. And, and this list is just a subset of the list that uh, Chaba Sepesvari, who is also one of the EMI fellows, he actually uh, raised, uh, and he has many, many slides. So if you're interested, this is, this is available online. So going back, I think that when I think about how I talk about my research, how I, how I, uh, how I, I think about the problems that I want to tackle, I think that we have to think more carefully about the problems we tackle and definitely how we talk about them because it's about expectation management and how other people see that. It doesn't change what we do or how we, what we believe, but it's about how other people see that. The third topic that maybe for this audience is not so controversial is going to be to learn continually. Uh, and what I mean by that is that when we go to the standard textbook figure and what we see in a lot of talks, this is what we have. We have an agent interacting with the environment, the agent is receiving observations and rewards, and then the agent is taking actions. And this is perfectly accurate. But, it's a, but it can be a little bit misleading because maybe the real picture should be this one. The world is much bigger. The agent cannot capture all the complexities of the world. Uh, because the world has other agents, to say the least, right? Like, it's not that the agent can learn something and never learn again. So you need to be constantly learning and adapting. And this happens, this is real. Like, uh, I'm talk going to talk about a little bit this at the end of the talk, but when we look at water, like, this is a problem that we have been working on, um, with, uh, which, which is being led by Adam and Martha White, which are two of the fellows here, as well as Amy. When we look at water treatment plant, for example, uh, this is the, the measurement of the same sensor over four different days of a water treatment plant throughout the day. So what you see is that on May 28th, May 29th, May 30th, for until half of the day, you could kind of see a pattern here. And you could say that, oh yeah, given the data, I can definitely learn a system that predicts the value of the sensor and it's going to be okay. But lo and behold, on May 31st, things become very different. And if you have a fixed solution that you deployed, which is what we do in machine learning nowadays, uh, it doesn't work, right? Like, we are going to have a huge cost, at least on May 31st. And this consistently happens over the data because you cannot model the weather. You cannot model whether the, the snow is going to start uh, 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 melting at the mountains. You cannot model if there's going to be a wild forest fire somewhere that is going to impact 
this is about the turbidity of the water, so it's how it's going to impact the water. So it's very tied to what Cam was saying yesterday at his keynote about the importance of real-time learning, because this, this, this is real. This is a real problem that we have to deal with. But let's go back to see where we are in the field in terms of that. Uh, and this is, uh, let's think about how we deal with deep reinforcement learning. And I'm going to look at a very specific problem, which is just having a rainbow agent playing Atari games. Rainbow Agent is an extremely performant algorithm, and if you don't have kids at the right age, maybe you don't know My Little Pony, but this is Agent Rainbow, and I wouldn't miss the opportunity of having Agent Rainbow being the depiction of the Rainbow Agent in reinforcement learning. Um, but what happens here is that if you look at this, this Rainbow Agent has a neural network in it. And the neural network has more parameters than the number of bits in the RAM of Atari. So it's kind of flipped, right? Like uh, it's a really big network for a, for a problem with 2K of RAM. So what we set up to do was, what if we may try to make this environment bigger? And we still want to use Atari. People like Atari. I like Atari. So um, we're going to make this, we're going to call this switching ALE uh, because ALE because it's the arcade learning environment, which was also proposed here at the University of Alberta by Michael Bowling, one of the Amy Fellows. Uh, and, and what we're going to do here is that we're going to have the agent playing a game. And after 20 million steps, the agent's going to play a different game. And after 20 million steps, the agent's going to play a different game, and so on and so forth. The agent's going to do this with five different games for the sake of this, this talk. And, and the key thing here is that the agent doesn't know the game is going to change. The game even changes at regular intervals, but the agent is does not able to model that the world that these agents is, the, the, the games are going to change. So the agent needs to either learn uh, independent policies that work for all everything that it has seen. But again, it's kind of a big deal to do this because there are so many things that you can see, or the agent needs to be constantly learning. And then we set up to evaluate: Can the agent actually do this? Uh, well, and this is a learning curve. And this is a, hang in there, the learning curve is the following. In the y-axis, we have the performance. In the x-axis, you have time. So at the beginning, when you see this blue curve going up, is the performance of the agent, this rainbow agent, playing the game of Alien. So it's the first 20 million steps of this agent's life, if you will. Um, and it's all good. But then what happens is that after 20 million steps, the agent goes to play a different game. And I'm not reporting the performance of the agent in that different game here. I'm just reporting the performance of the agent in the, the, the game of Alien. So now the agent's going to play Alien for the first time for 20 million steps. Now a different game shows up, and the agent's going to play that game for 20 million steps, the other game for 20 million steps. So, so 80 million steps will have happened uh, then. And then the agent goes back to Alien. So this point at the bottom of the first tip is actually what the agent sees with it's like it's the 20 million plus one step in the game of Alien, but the agent actually lived 100 million steps. And what we see is that the agent is really bad. The agent is worse than it was by being randomly start, uh, restart, uh, starting at the beginning of that previous thing. But then the curve goes up again because the agent continues to learn. But what it's interesting to notice here is that the curve goes up but it goes up at a much slower rate than this gray curve that is what would have happened if the agent had just been restarted. Then you say, you know what? 100 million steps of data, throw it in the garbage. Start from scratch. Have you heard this before? Balloons, yeah? So throw the data away and start again. And this is what we do. We would be better off. And it's not only that. It just gets worse. Every time the agent revisits that game, it's becoming worse and worse. The agent is losing its ability to learn or how Ritzet and, and Rupam, alongside uh, with, uh, with the work led by Shibanshi, they call this loss of plasticity. The agent is losing this ability to, to learn. And I think this is problematic. In this particular paper we wrote, uh, we even propose a very simple mitigation strategy on how we can preserve uh, the agent's ability to learn. In this particular problem, the agent doesn't lose plasticity if you, you use a different activation function. Uh, and it's pretty close to the reset function, but again, you see that the agent is not being able to leverage the previous experience. The agent is just being able to not forget, for, to not completely go havoc on learning. 
And this is very clear here. Like this red curve is what would have happened if the agent was just playing this game. And then you would see that the curve would just go up. So we definitely, we, we can say that in this, pro, in this particular problem, we definitely solved the loss of plasticity, but we definitely didn't know how to leverage past experience, uh, and we are constantly learning from scratch. So as Douglas Adams wrote, you live and learn. At any rate, you live. And it definitely feels that a lot of our reinforcement learning algorithms right now, they're just living. They cannot learn in a long time. Um, so going back, uh, this, are, this is the third point that are things that just are becoming increasingly obvious to me when I think about the problems and how I should be thinking about reinforcement learning. Uh, so figure out how to leverage externally generated data when available. Think carefully about the problems we tackle and how we talk about them and to learn continually. And the fourth one is to think carefully about the hardware or about the computational models our algorithms is going to use. And what I mean by, by this is the following. When we look at the success that deep learning had 15, 20 years ago, and you ask a lot of the people, they say, oh, why, is, why was that? So like, well, data availability was obviously a big deal. We also had a couple of algorithmic improvements that allowed us to get there. Uh, but also was the use of GPUs. It was figuring out how to use GPUs. Yes, that weird piece of hardware that people used to play computer games. How to, do the, how to run our algorithms. It's not that there, was li there were libraries. That, it's not that NVIDIA wrote deep learning libraries for people and said, like, look, now it's available to you. Someone actually went and had to go on and figure out how to write CUDA software and how to, to leverage that. And this was crucial. I guess it's obvious to say, given how many, how, how many of us cannot even think about our research without GPUs, right? But then when I talk, when I talk about reinforcement learning, and when I say we, I mean a lot of the research community. But when I talk about this, I still have this tendency to talk about online single stream reinforcement learning using a von Neumann sequential architecture. And then I talk about the big O notation about how many computations are going to be done. And sometimes I'm not even thinking if I can actually parallelize that computation uh, and if it's going to be fast or not because I'm using a tensor processing unit or a GPU. Uh, that's how we just, I quite often, and it's a confession that I make, it's not that everyone do this, um, that I, I think about it this way. Uh, and then when I think about the revolution that we faced with language recently, it, one of the main reasons is transformers. And because one of the things that transformers was one of the main selling points, like it's literally in the abstract of the paper, is that they were more parallelizable. Uh, so again, the question here, and this is a question that I ask myself, is like, how often do we think about the hardware when we are designing our algorithms? And when I talk about this, I talk about thinking about it carefully, right? Like, of course, I, I, don't, I, I, I assume that a lot of people here in the audience are very comfortable with basic computer architecture, ba how computers work and the computational models. So, but it's about how is this actually going to be run, you know? Uh, and maybe I'm the only one who does that, so I apologize if I'm the only one who doesn't think about it. And it's not that we haven't done this in the past, right? Like, uh, when I think about, we have different architectures that we could be thinking about this. Uh, so back in 1990, Rich Sutton came up with Dyna that does a lot of computation in the background. Now, if we think about a lot of these processing units that we have now that can do a lot of things in parallel, would, couldn't we be able to leverage a lot of this computation in the background to do this? Uh, and we have a lot of examples of things that were transformative in reinforcement learning, and maybe they were transformative for doing exactly what I'm describing. We can use more samples at a time with an experience replay buffer. If we have an experience replay buffer and we suddenly sample a mini batch from there, we're not uh, uh, sampling only one experience, we're sampling dozens of them, right? Uh, we can parallelize data generation, and this is something that you can see if it's C and PPO, for example, that we have a lot of uh, environments running parallel, and a lot of the data generation is, is parallelized, and you can accelerate things. And those things are a big deal. We were only able to fly balloons in the stratosphere because we had an experience replay buffer, and we could parallelize the computation and the data generation. So, I mean, where do ideas actually come from? Maybe it should be mostly from getting annoyed at things. 
maybe it's about getting annoyed at having to wait my rainbow agent to learn how to play a single Atari game in five whole days. So it's not the big issue so much, so as the little irritations that drive you wide out of proportion. And maybe, and I know for a fact that some of those developments here, like paralyzing data generation, was exactly about not wanting to wait that long. So I think that there is something to be, to be said there. And, and again, because I'm apparently a very self-centered person and I wanted to make this talk about myself, uh, I want to share with you some of the recent learning experience that I went through, just so I can embarrass myself in front of the audience. So quite often we can think about this in terms of observations. We think about reinforcement learning as you have an observation, then you have a black box that is going to output state action value functions, which is just a function seeing how good each action is in a particular state or in a particular observation. Um, probably should be Q of, S, of O here, but anyway. Uh, and then the way we think about this, the way I used to think about this for a very long time, was like, hey, it's a black box, right? Like you can use this as a neural network or you can use it as a linear function approximation. Each one of those black boxes come with some bells and whistles, but at the end of the day, it's a black box. We can, we can use it, it's fine. And then there's a new cool kid in the neighborhood, transformers. So I can just change the black box, right? Like, let's use transformers as part of this black box. What could go wrong? Uh, well, let, let me tell you a little bit of how those technologies work. So let's first go back to a standard recurrent neural network, which is the thing that I was talking at the beginning of this talk. And let's say that I have this recurrent neural network that has the goal is to learn how to translate from English to Portuguese. So it receives as input the word I, so it goes into this neural network and it's going to output eu. It's the first word that I say without an accent in the talk. Uh, and then I do it again, and then I have a second word, which is m. And then the recurrent neural network has some sort of me internal memory about the I that it just saw, and then it outputs so. And then you see Brazilian, and then it's a Brasileiro. And then suddenly you have, eu sou Brasileiro out of I'm Brazilian. And this is perfect for reinforcement learning. You receive an observation, you do some computation, and you output the, the state action value function of that, of that observation. This is perfect, right? But now let's talk about transformers. Transformers work slightly different. And this figure is still a simplification of the actual transformers thing. And it's, it even has an oversimplification because the attention mechanism is not there. So this is being recorded, and I know the attention mechanism is not there for the sake of history. Uh, but the point is that the way we do it is that I am Brazilian is the input, and here it's going to output, it's, you encode all of that, all those words or those tokens, and it outputs eu sou brasileiro, okay? But the key thing here is that it inputs to the encoder everything at the same time, which is the selling point of transformers because if you want to deal with a sentence, you have the sentence beforehand. And this is what being more parallelizable means. But this is a problem for reinforcement learning because what am I going to feed? Am I going to feed OT, OT plus one, OT plus two? Like am I looking at the future what the observations are going to be? But isn't the action that I take to, def to define OT plus one, isn't it defined by OT? I, can, I cannot see the future. So, of course, like this is the simplest single stream, one sample at a time computation model in reinforcement learning. We can be, we can do all sorts of different things. We can think about parallelizing a lot of the computation. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we can think about parallelizing a lot of the computation uh, with uh, partial environment, with um, parallel environments. We can think about trajectory level uh, optimization. There are things to be done. But the point is just to show how Sometimes thinking about the hardware and carefully understanding how they work, it might, you might realize, oh wait, I, I didn't think that carefully about this. We have uh, Adam White and I have a master student, Subo, who is working on this. So it's a transformer version uh, for reinforcement learning. He has a poster here today, so if people are interested, just look for him. But we have this online recurrent linear transformer. I, I will not explain it, it's complicated. But the point is just that, in simple environments, we are being able to get the best of two worlds. We are being able to get some of the benefits of transformers, but also some of the computational efficiency of recurrent neural networks, and, and things seem to be working. But of course, in reinforcement learning, things are not so obvious. Sometimes, transformers are not better than recurrent neural networks, uh, and we are not the first ones to talk about this. Um, 
it's, it's not that we've invented something groundbreaking. It's being documented that time series forecasting and things like that can be a problem for transformers. But again, this is just to go back to this point about understanding the computation, understanding how those things interact. And I think this is, this is important, you know. So going back, this, I finally delivered the trilogy in four parts. It's a figure out how to leverage externally generated data when it's available. Think carefully about the problem we tackle and how we talk about them. Learning continually, and maybe you're frowning because learning continually seems awfully close to thinking carefully about the problems we tackle, but it's a trilogy in four parts, so I get away with it if I'm a little bit imprecise. And then we think carefully about the hardware that we're going to use. Okay? But to wrap up, I want to talk about an example that I think that checks a lot of those boxes that we're doing here at Amy. And it goes back to the water treatment plant. So water treatment plant is the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the problem of water treatment is just that you might have a river and you want to treat the water that is coming down the river to make it a drinkable water. So there is going to be a water source, there's a bunch of stages along the way that ask Adam White about this if you, if you want to actually know this stuff. But you have to pre-treat the water, you throw some chemicals, nasty stuff floats, you, you filter the water, and eventually you have drinking water, okay? There's a lot of steps along the way. And, but then, if we go back to thinking carefully about the problems we want to tackle, it's hard to think about a more impactful and more important problem than providing actually drinkable water to human beings, right? Like, it's kind of a big deal. I hear we kind of need water. Um, and, and it's not that we have the ability to do that. We're just trying to replace humans. Quite often, in hard to reach regions, in Canada, for example, we have the, the resources to actually build a water treatment plant to serve the population, but we don't have an operator for that plant. So we actually don't build it because we're going to have this huge thing that cannot be operated. But then if we could automate this process, then we could provide drinking water to a population that actually can't. Sometimes finding someone to operate this plant is the challenge. And as I said, it's a really difficult problem that requires us real-time learning. We have to be continually learning. And this is just a day, but like, and you look at over the, the data sensors over a year, it's a nightmare when we look at turbidity of the water, temperature of the water. Some things are obvious, like during the summer, the tem water temperature goes up, yay. But we have things that are different, like there is this dark shade, this, this um, this, uh, this dark gray thing, that it's the freshet season, which is something that I was unaware of before I moved to Canada become, I come, because I come from Brazil, uh, which is snow actually melts during the summer and then it goes to the water and it impacts a lot of the, the things that you see, the turbidity of the water and so on, and eventually it freezes again, and yeah, weather in Canada. Uh, but this is, this, is, this is a real problem that we have to deal with, like this constant changing of the data at multiple time scales. So going back to the trilogy in four parts, um, I think that we have to figure out how to leverage externally generated data. And when I think about the water treatment, this is great because we don't actually have access to the simulator. We don't even get to cheat because we do not have a simulator and we do not know how to build one. We, can think care we should think carefully about the, the, the problems we tackle and a real world problem that it's really hard to describe with language that it's one of the most important things seems pretty big deal to me. Learning continually is unavoidable. And, th and when I think about carefully about the hardware, at least we can have multiple parallel predictions happening at the same time and we can heavily, left, uh, heavily lift the, the, the hardware. We're not doing this, but it's an opportunity for us to think about those things. So, I want to thank anyone, everyone. I want to reiterate my point, which is don't panic if you're a grad student in the room and you're thinking about what is the meaning of life because maybe I should be doing large language models. Uh, but I think that there are lessons that we could be learning uh, about the success of every field. And I'm just talking about the most recent success that we had. Um, so let's think the unthinkable. Let's do the undoable. Let us prepare to grapple with the ineffable itself and see if we may not F it after all. Thank you very much. If anyone has questions for Marlos, there's uh, mics at one, two, and three between each row. So please, we've got about 15 minutes to have a question and answer period. So just pop up there and we'll, we'll give you the signal to go. Hi, Marlos. 
Awesome, on mic one, or three, sorry. Hi, hello. Uh, can you give a bit more detail about the uh, RCA input? Do you, in general, do the prediction before you input it to the RIA agent training, or is it done at the same time? I mean, can you, and what kind of algorithm do you typically use? I mean, is it possible, for instance, to input a prediction from an LSTM directly? I mean, yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that's a great question. So this is really problem dependent. Um, for the balloons thing, for example, the auxiliary inputs that we used, they were a whole paper by itself, right? Like they had to build a Gaussian process. It was a lot of computing that went on before we actually even could get the, the auxiliary input. So then at the moment that we, that we can compute it. So in a sense, now we have an observation. We update the auxiliary input and we feed this, but a lot of the computation is happening outside. Uh, when we talk about the example that I gave here that was fairly straightforward, it's an exponential decay. That happens on every single step, and you can do it online. Uh, can you feed an LSTM uh, input to that? You can. We tried, and it was really hard, really difficult. It seems unstable. Uh, it's tied a lot of to predictive state representations and general value functions, which is exactly this notion of feeding predictions as input. So like, there is very well-developed theory about that and how this is a great idea. Sometimes making it work is a little bit finicky and it really depends on the problem you have. Mic number two. So I'm wondering whether uh, the continued learning problem is only a problem of small scales, because we don't see it much in larger scales. For example, the LLMs can learn from much bigger data sets than their number of parameters. So I was wondering if uh, it's going to solve by itself, just scaling up. This is a, question of almost faith, you know, like it's like it's a matter of belief, like do you believe in that or not? And mathematically speaking, it can't solve itself, right? Like if the world is too complex, there is no magic that is going on into a large language model that is able to learn everything that's going on and it can adapt online. That being said, what's going on is that large language models are not solving everything. They're solving a very specific problem, which is language that can have, I mean, it's not even solved, but it's just like they're dealing with language, which means that you have, the question is like, how big is the problem actually? Like, do you have a set of underlying latent variables that if you capture them, then a lot of the, thing, the tasks that you're going to be faced with, they're going to be a combination of that. In a, so I don't have the answer to that question. I think that it's important to realize that as impressive as large language models is, and Despite my joke at the beginning, I didn't want to say anything bad about them uh, during the talk. That was never my intention. It's, it's important to remind ourselves that they're just solving a tiny fraction of, of, the, of the problem, which is language, right? Like, and then if things are changing along the way, well, like, then you have to adapt. And then you might say, wait, there are different ways of learning. Maybe you want to do in-context learning, and you want to keep feeding the context to the large language model, and it will learn a function out of that context. Yes, but that's different, right? Like, so, but I think that continually learning is important, and let's just state the obvious, right? Like, I checked. You asked ChatGPT who won the World Cup in 2022, and ChatGPT says, I'm sorry, I have been trained with only data up to 2021, so I don't have the answer for that. So, like, I think that there is definitely a role for continual learning to, to play. Uh, and I don't buy, like, unless, I mean, the, this is a philosophical debate, right? Like, how many variables? Can I explain the universe in five equations? And then that's it. So, if, I mean, I don't have an answer for that question, but I, my gut feeling is that right now we're far behind that, and we definitely need to be continually learning and adapting to be able to succeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mic number three. Um, thanks, Marlos, for the great talk. I have a more of a probing question to the point you mentioned that environment is usually like a big space for agent. Agents are usually smaller. Yeah. Environments are super big. So more of a probing question into some of the problems that might be in research that we might have 
might want to probe into. The problem formulation where the agent is smaller, environment is bigger, so opposite to what we have in, in let's say, ChatGPT, where like having billions of parameters and kind of modeling the whole world, essentially, right? So what kind of problems can you kind of look into to probe that? Yeah, so I mean, I don't even want to suggest that we should be looking at small agents in a sense. We could have ChatGPT, which is billions of parameters, because the world is going to be unavoidably bigger, right? So it's like it's not necessarily small agents in big roads or small agents in medium sized words. It's about the agent that it's smaller than the world, you know, like. Um, so, but then in, ter in terms of, the, I guess, your second problem, what types of problems we could be looking at. Uh, and I mean, the switching ALE was one of them, but then I will use your talk to use my backup slide, which is I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that I don't know the answer. I am looking for those problems. Um, I'm very, I think that thinking carefully about the problem and understanding those, I think that this is one of the main challenges that we have. Um, and then we can design experiments like the switching ALE that allows us to ask one specific question, but then of course this is a, to ask a specific question is not a fundamental problem that we need to solve, and I'm actually open to suggestions. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? One more. Mic number two. Hi. Um, regarding causality or the study of causation, I don't know how much you incorporate that in your studies, but uh, how do you perceive that reinforcement learning is going to progress now, not in terms of problem domain, but in problems of transparency and um, understanding the co-founders that affect the environment? Yeah, no, that's a great and long-winded and long, and, and long -winded question. I should have used my backup slide here, so I will use it again. I don't know the answer. Uh, but um, I think that there are a couple of things that we have. Like, when we think about causality, let's unpack this question. The first thing about causality is just like, a lot of the research in causality is thinking that, let's say that I just have data and I cannot interact with the environment then I cannot infer counterfactuals, for example. When you look at the definition of a state action value function, it's literally a counterfactual. You're learning what would have, I did in state S, I took action A, one, but what, if, what would have happened if I had taken action A, two? And so by interacting with the world and actually experiment, you are making interventions and you could be learning a causal model. Do our algorithms do this? Not necessarily, and model-based reinforcement learning surprisingly hard compared to model-free reinforcement learning. Uh, but I think that there is a very nice interplay that in a sense we should be able to communicate more with the causality community uh, when talking about this. But now when you talk about confounders and things like that, well, this is quite loaded because in a sense it's about the function approximator we are using as well, right? Like, so it's about can we, a supervised learning problem, it's a simpler problem than reinforcement learning, and we can barely scratch the surface of explainability or understanding the confounders there. So I think it's definitely a research question. Um, I think that we can aim to have algorithms that are more understandable. We did some of this when we were flying the balloons in the stratosphere, for example. A long, I spent a ridiculously long amount of time in that project trying to explain to the low engineers how the balloon was acting. So it's just like, why is this different than whatever you are doing? Because it's like, we just don't want to deploy something random, right? So there is work to be done, but again, it seems very domain specific, and I personally don't know of any technique that is general enough that would be applicable, but I think it's a great research question. If we have no more questions, thanks. Any more? Nope. Thank you so much, Marlos. Thank you. Thank you.